Welcome to Grace, Hope, Love, the broadcast ministry of Calvary Chapel Birmingham in beautiful Alabama. I am so glad you've chosen to join us as we explore the Bible verse by verse and chapter by chapter. Through this ministry, we are reaching thousands around the world with the amazing, exciting, and life-changing Word of God. To learn more about Calvary Chapel Birmingham and God's plan for your life, or how you can partner with this ministry, go to calvarybirmingham.com. Today, God has an extra special message just for you. So grab a cup of coffee, pull up a comfy chair, open your Bible, and let's dig in. chapter 17 today. John 17 is a great place to to drop your anchor. When you feel the the seas of life have just been stirred up and the waves have have gotten huge around you, maybe you're in the midst of a, a tempest of some kind, this is a good place to go. Jesus' disciples they knew about storms and they knew about tempests. And after coming, uh, after the upper room discourse and, and following Jesus down towards the Garden of Gethsemane, where we'll see in our next chapter, Jesus is betrayed and arrested. You know, they, they need some place where they could set their anchor because that storm was nearing. Jesus prayed aloud here on purpose to give them that place. In the Gospel of Mark, we're told of a time when, when Jesus and his disciples took a boat to cross the Sea of Galilee. And on their way across, as, as Jesus slept, a great windstorm arose and the tiny ship was tossed, if not for the courage of the fearless crew. That's not how it happened, is it? The fearless crew, they freaked out. And they shook Jesus awake. And they said... How can you be sleeping? Can you not see that all is lost? Not those exact words, but that's what they meant. That was the gist of what they said. Mark 4, 39-40 says, Jesus then arose and he rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace be still, and the wind ceased. And there was a great calm. But he said to them, Why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? When they set out on that voyage, Jesus said they were going to cross to the other side. That was a promise he was going to keep. Remember that storms come not necessarily because we have done something wrong or because we have been disobedient. In fact, Warren Wearsby, he observed that Jonah ended up in a storm because of his disobedience, but the disciples ended up in a storm because of their obedience to the Lord. You know, storms are an opportunity for us to have great victory. And since Philippians 4 says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, let's go ahead and get this idea of success and failure in Christian life out of our vocabulary. Our our tendency is to to think of things in those terms. Terms of (laughs) success, excuse me, (laughs) terms of success, terms of failure, you know, but God looks beyond those things. He gets to the real heart of the matter. That's why God's promise to us of Romans 8.28, of Jeremiah 29.11, that's why these promises and other scriptures, promises and other scriptures, that's why they seem to defy our understanding. In fact, I think we can say with confidence that once we have accepted Jesus as our Lord and our Savior, we can drop the idea of success or failure because our lives now belong to the one who already purchased victory for us with his own blood. So then, what do we call those times when we are facing trials? Or what do we name those those storms of life that, that send us to the bottom? How about opportunity? You see, as painful as storms can be, there are often win-win situations in which even if our faith is shaken, so long as we go to Jesus, He will make the most of the moment, redeeming that storm so that instead of evil, there's good. Finally, 
there's great intimacy in Jesus' relationship with us that he expresses in this prayer. You see, not only would Jesus die for us, but even as the time of his suffering on our behalf neared, he was thinking about us in terms of kinship and unity, in terms of love, joy, peace, grace, and compassion. This is truly remarkable, and it reminds me of another time during Jesus' ministry. Matthew 13 records that one day Jesus went out of the house to the Sea of Galilee, and he just sat. That's really an incredible picture. I mean, God with us, taking the time to just sit and look out across his creation. I read that, and I, I wonder, what was he thinking about? Was he thinking about you? Was he thinking about me? Psalm chapter 40, verse 5 says, Your thoughts toward us cannot be recounted to you in order. And it says they are more than can be numbered. God's thoughts of us are so numerous that they can't be numbered. In other words, you and I are always on his mind. On my last trip to Israel, which has been a few years now, there was this one moment, I'll never forget this moment because it was, it was so wonderful. These trips to Israel, when you go on one, it, they tend to get really busy. I mean, you're constantly going from place to place to place to get everything in. And so when you get a moment just to relax, it's, it's kind of the odd moment, you know. But on my last trip to Israel, there was a moment at sunset where I was able to just sit at the, sea, at the shore of the Sea of Galilee and look out across the waters. And it was just, it, it was quiet and it was beautiful. The sun was setting gently over the hills behind me and reflected the shades of orange, red, pink, purples on the hills on the other side of that sea cast long shadows across the water. And I was able to just be still in that moment. I was given a, a revelation of God's creative might, of His redeeming power so visible in creation. Psalm 46.10 says, Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. God will be exalted. And Jesus lived so as to exalt the Father, always doing the will of the Father and speaking that which the Father told Him. And so in the prayer of the Son this morning, we see the attitude of the Father toward those who are His. Now I bring this up because I want to remind us of something we talked about last week and kind of expound on that for just a minute before we dig into this chapter. That is that in this prayer, Jesus is not praying for the world. Jesus didn't pray for the world. He died for the world. And having risen and ascended to the Father, He has sent His Holy Spirit into the world to convict the world of sin and righteousness. While nailed to the cross, Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And that's good for us to remember when our spirits ache and groan over seeing the world and all the wrong things, doing all the wrong things, making all the wrong moves. You see the world celebrating sin, going downhill like heck in a handbasket. And yet they crave sin all the more. They even celebrate sin, even call it liberty. The world is lost without Jesus. And so why would we expect anything but resistance and anger when the sin of the world is revealed by the light? And understanding, that we, understanding what we should expect, we should not take it personally when the world reacts in anger to the light. But with that same love and compassion with which Jesus went to the cross for the world, so we must be willing to face the anger of the world with grace. Meeting anger not with anger, but with love, with grace, with mercy. Now as we head into this chapter, there are a few things I want us to, to have fresh in our minds. First, as we talked about on Wednesday, the state of the world, this nation, and what is coming. 
We have a fresh reminder this morning that we don't need to be freaked out over anything that is happening in the world. Jesus headed to the cross. He took time to pray for us, facing a horrifying death, yet his thoughts were of us. Second, let's remember that God is not distant. No one has seen the Father in all his glory, but we have the perfect revelation of him in the Son. And even as the Son has ascended to the right hand of the Father, so we believe, we who believe on Jesus are indwelt by the Holy Spirit. God identifies us as His own, not by a ring, not by some mark, but rather by His Spirit, which He has placed in our hearts, sealing us as His very own. Third, Jesus' ministry of intercession is for those who believe who are His. Even as we are in the world, we are separated unto the Lord. Jesus gave His life for the world, but redemption is only for those who will believe in Him for salvation. Likewise, in His further ministry of intercession on our behalf before the Father, that intercession is only for those who have believed in Him. We will talk this morning about sanctification or being set apart as belonging to God. And so we'll, we'll wait until later, really, to touch on this. Now, having said all of that, let's go ahead and dig in. Jesus had been praying for his disciples, his, his Talmudim, and that's where we pick it up this morning. We'll, we'll go back to the beginning of the chapter to keep it in context. So starting with verse 1, it says, Jesus spoke these words, lifted up his eyes to heaven, and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that your Son also may glorify you, as you have given him authority over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I have glorified you on the earth. I have finished the work which you have given me to do. And now, O Father, glorify me together with yourself, with the glory which I had with you before the world was. I have manifested your name to the men whom you have given me out of the world. They were yours. You kept them to me, and they have kept your word. You gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they have known that all things which you have given me are from you. For I have given to them the words which you have given me, and they have received them. And have known surely that I came forth from you, and they have believed that you sent me. I pray for them. I do not pray for the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours. And all mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I am glorified in them. Now I am no longer in the world, but these are in the world. And I, co and I come to you, Holy Father, keep, the, keep through your name those whom you have given me, that they may be one as we are. So we left off last week in verse 9. It, and so from, from verse 6 through 11, Jesus is speaking of unity. That of the, the Godhead, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, as well as the unity of disciples and believers. Now what Jesus is not speaking of is unity between light and darkness, morality and immorality, good and evil, or between the world and Christians. Jesus is talking to the Father, praying that those who are His will be in unity. This is an exclusive statement by Jesus. It excludes Christian unity from those who do not belong to Christ. And let me preface this by saying that whether or not someone belongs to the Father is a choice that person makes by either rejecting or submitting themselves to Christ. There's a movement about, and it really has been to some degree for a long time, to promote peace and unity by creating a melting pot of beliefs by merging Christianity with other things. Hey, Chrislam is probably the most familiar these days because it's getting the most attention right now. But if you go back and you look, look through Christian history, you'll discover that there has always been certain wolves among the church who have sought to bring in spiritism, Wicca, other things that have no business in the church. And this goes back a long time in history. So we see that today, and also the idea that by watering down the offense of the gospel, more people will receive the gospel. The problem is that those very things that make the gospel offensive are also the key components to the gospel. 
And so a watered-down gospel usually leads to unrepentant, false conversions based on an incomplete understanding of repentance and submission to Christ. In America and around the world, there, there are movements underfoot to subject clear biblical doctrine to interpretation and change based on cultural opinion. We find religious pluralism making inroads in the church today. Religious pluralism is wrongly thinking that Jesus is just one of several valid ways to God. Subjectivism is gaining. Subjectivism is saying, if I, if I can't know what's really out there, I'll just have to form my own beliefs based on my own thinking, based on my own feelings, based on my own desires and my own circumstances. Pragmatic religion is a major force in the church today. If it works, then it must be right, whether it contradicts the Bible or not. A good example would be having secular music during worship um, because it brings people to the church. Therapeutic religion says it's God's job to make us happy. And so pastors should then be cheerleaders instead of being uh, teachers and shepherds. Finally, there, there are other things like materialism and placing style over substance. And these lead to congregations more concerned with being entertained than growing in God. You know, I follow quite a few churches on my Twitter account, and I, as well as pastors, and I've often been encouraged by what, we've, what I, I see posted. Sometimes I've, I've been amused by what I see posted. Sometimes I've been, frankly, disturbed by what I've seen posted. Uh, one church, we talked about this last Sunday, but one church in North Carolina posted on their official Twitter account a quote from Ralph Waldo Emerson. It said, the highest revelation is that God is in every man. Well, there's a big problem with that quote, especially coming from a Christian church. First of all, it's from a man who was immersed in mysticism and transcendentalism. Secondly, it contradicts the Bible. So the fact that it, that it was posted on the official Twitter feed of a, a church is disturbing to me. Now, we talked about that last week, so I'm not going to really delve into that, but know that, that, that the Bible disagrees with that statement and God, that statement that God is in every man. The Bible disagrees with that. If you want to know how, if, if you missed last week's teaching, go back and listen to that, and I explained it. Now, another tweeting pastor this past week quoted the, the spiritist Wayne Dyer. This quote was, If you are living out of a sense of obligation, you are a slave. Now, Wayne Dyer meant that quote, meaning both obligation and slave, these things are negative. And in that quote, uh, I, the fact that, that that pastor tweeted that, I have to assume that that pastor agrees with that sentiment. Now, a baby Christian who reads that or hears a teaching using that quote may conclude that he bears no obligation to God, nor any need for righteousness. But the Bible speaks of both, our being obliged to God and our being slaves of righteousness. Romans 6.18 says, And having been set free from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. Romans 12.1-2 says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. There's a fallacy about these days that teaches that serving God out of love has to exclude any feeling of obligation. That love and obligation can't go hand in hand. That if you're in any way serving God because you have a sense of obligation to Him, then you must have a problem with love. You know, that same sentiment has ended a lot of marriages. Because sometimes you fall back on obligation. Now, obligation is the recognition of, no, of a noble calling. It's a recognition of a heavenly purpose. And when obligation does not seek to win approval, but to demonstrate thankfulness for approval... Obligation then is by love 
and from love, demonstrating a productive and fruitful relationship between the source of love and the beloved. It bothers me for, for a church or a pastor to be tweeting those things because it has the potential of misleading so many. But, you know, these, these things are emblematic of the ecumenism that we see today, the apostasy that's on the rise in the church today. And these are the things that are coming out of many seminaries today. Be very careful with any teaching that adds to or takes away from the scriptures that God has given to us. Verse 11 says, Now I am no longer in the world, but these are in the world, and I come to you, Holy Father. Keep through your name those whom you have given me, that they may be one as we are. See, Jesus prays for unity in the body of Christ, yet at the same time we cannot be united with anyone who opposes Christ. Jesus is not saying that we should pursue unity with those who deny the clear teaching of Scripture. Or that since we are in the world, we should look and act like the world. But as the Father and the Son are in union, so also Jesus prays for us to be in union. And that is not a forced union or a union that causes us to have to pretend or or get along with someone who grates at our every nerve. This is the unity of true believers whom the Holy Spirit takes and baptizes into the body of Christ. In that body, we find people that that we get along well with, and we also find people that really just, just get on our last nerve. Yet we are still brothers and sisters in Christ, the family of God. In Christ. And so we set aside non doctrinal issues, non doctrinal differences, and when we are together worshiping God, we raise our hands together, we lift up our voices together, we, we, we learn together with no pretending and no pretense. Our minds and actions confirming our unity, for in Christ alone our hope is found. Even as Jeremiah said in Lamentations 3.24, the Lord is my portion. Therefore, I hope in him. Jesus prays to the Father that we should be kept. And just as the Holy Spirit identifies us in the body of Christ, so also the Holy Spirit seals us as belonging to Christ. In John 10.27-30, Jesus said, My sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish. No one can snatch them away from me, for my Father has given them to me. (laughs) And he is more powerful than anyone else. No one can snatch them from my Father's hand. The Father and I are one. That's some great news. There's no terror, there's no no fear, there's no stumble, nor, nor fault. No distress, no tragedy, no person, no evil that can snatch us away from Christ. Once we're in his hands, we remain in his hands. With no possibility of being taken or stolen away. Verse 12 says, While I was with them in the world, I kept them in your name. Those whom you gave me I have kept, and none of them is lost except the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. So while he was with his disciples, they were kept in the Father's name, and in other words, by his power and authority, and none of them were lost, except for the son of perdition, which was Judas. Now Jesus is not saying that all that were his were kept safe except for Judas, as if he lost Judas. He's saying that Judas was not his in the first place. Judas was a pretender. He was a play actor. The word that's that's translated lost here, it actually means not claimed. It's a positional statement. Judas was never his in the first place. Likewise, we we do not look at Christians who have abandoned their faith and say that Jesus lost them either. You know, yep, I I was sure Johnny was saved, but then Jesus just dropped him. Just right out of his hand, just dropped him on the floor. I told him he shouldn't wear that slippery hair gel. No, this, this has to do with either being his or not being his. And so we recognize that someone who denies their faith was never in God's hand to be lost in the first place. 
Again, as we've talked about, salvation is evidence in our words, our actions, and can be discerned in someone's life as easily as distinguishing a dead body from a live person. You know, a living body is evidenced as being alive by those things that you would expect a living body to do. Breathing, eating. Used to be working. <laughs> not, not everybody works these days. Walking. A dead body can be identified by its lack of those things, as well as by its corruption, its stiffness, and its stink. Now, some people have a problem with this statement, identifying Judas as the son of perdition, which implies that Judas was consigned to ruin. You know, everyone has a choice to make. Judas made the choice to betray Jesus, not because there was a prophecy to be fulfilled, but because he rejected Jesus. And because Judas rejected Jesus, prophecy was fulfilled. The nature of prophecy is that it's not self-fulfilling, but rather that it is fulfilled by people making their own choices and unwittingly fulfilling prophecy. Yet the fulfillment of prophecy is also never a random thing. But it's evidence of God concealed behind what appears to be randomness. Often God chooses to hide his activity behind this veil of, uh, of what is easily explainable or behind what is seemingly random. Sometimes God even hides his hiding. You know, God does this so that people have to choose to recognize his hand in things or choose not to recognize his involvement. Romans chapter 1 speaks of God's hand being plainly visible in creation. At the same time, it also speaks of man making a conscious choice not to recognize it. Of course, all of us here this morning recognize that God is sovereign over all things, recognize His hand in all things, and praising Him in all things, right? Right? Okay. The Bible takes issue with the notion that randomness rules the universe. And it even says that those who ignore God's hand in things will reap the wrath of the divine. And that wrath will itself take the form of randomness. I believe we see this kind of thing happening as, as seemingly random phenomena wreak havoc around the globe from riots to wars to natural disasters. In Deuteronomy 31, as Moses ascended Mount Nebo to, to glimpse the promised land from afar, before he died and departed this world, God explained to Moses that afflictions will befall Israel if they will go against the covenant that they've made with him. In Deuteronomy 31, God said, Then my anger shall be aroused against them in that day, and I will forsake them, and I will hide my face from them, and they shall be devoured, and many evils and troubles will befall them, so that they will say in that day, have not these evils come upon us because our God is not among us? And I will surely hide my face in that day because of all the evil which they have done and that they have turned to other gods. In that Deuteronomy, section of Deuteronomy there, when it says, I will surely hide my face, the literal meaning of that is, I will hide the hiding of my face. In other words, not only will God hide his face, but he will hide the hiding of his face. And we see this principle at work in, in the book of Esther, and where God is never mentioned in that whole book. Yet we see his hand at work in all the events of the book, moving to protect his people and bring destruction to those who sought evil against them. In fact, the root word of the name Esther means to hide. Now, what I'm, what I, uh, um, my intention in saying this is, is I want to tell you that God has plans for you. That God's hand is in all things, and despite whether a situation is characterized as uh, difficult or as uh, adverse or as beneficial, God is using it for good in your life. 
And he's using it to glorify his name through your life. Therefore, when Jesus points our eyes to the grass of the fields and to the sparrows of the air and says that if God takes care of such small things as these, he certainly will take care of us. We can be quickened, we can be energized, encouraged, knowing that despite the situation that we're in, whatever that situation may be, God is in control. His care for us is genuine. His plans for us are exceptionally good. And when Jesus tells us that we are kept, we can be confident that those who are his, us, that we are kept. Verse 13. But now I come to you, and these things I speak in the world, that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. Jesus says, hey guys, you need to listen to this. I'm praying out loud for your benefit. You know, we gain wonderful knowledge in this out loud prayer of Jesus. And because of this knowledge, we can take joy. God never intended for Christians to be prudes, to be uptight. He never intended for us to be joyless. In fact, Jesus was a very joyful person. If you were to walk up to a non-believer and ask if Jesus was a joyful person, there's a very good chance that they would answer that no, he was not. Yet in Jesus' time ministering on the earth, he's, we see him constantly being invited to dinners, invited to, to wedding in Cana, invited to all these things. We see crowds assembled around him. You know, that doesn't happen with people who are just angry and dour all the time. You know, and, and Jesus, Jesus manifested the fruits of the Spirit, one of which is joy. Galatians 5.22 lists those fruits of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. All these things ring true for Jesus. But you know, unbelievers... They identify Jesus with believers. After all, Paul wrote that we are Christ's ambassadors. And so I think any impression that Jesus was not joyful can be attributed to some unfortunate interaction um, with a Christian who just wasn't joyful. Jesus' joy sprung out of this intimate relationship with his Father and the, the Spirit and from his awareness of God's purposes, all things we see in this John 17 prayer. These are things Christians have as well through the, the many promises of God and through the work Jesus did on the cross, his resurrection, his ascension to heaven where he lives to make intercession for us. Do I think all Christians should be joyful? Yes. Now, I think we've got many reasons to be. God's deliverance. God's goodness. The rightness of God's precepts. Being in God's presence. Salvation. God's words. God's generosity. God's love. His grace and His mercy. Man, that's not an exhaustive list. But it sure is a good list. And it's a list of things that, that none of us in any way deserve Yet we receive, we receive these things when we accept Jesus as our Lord and our Savior. But if we stop there, we're only looking at one part of what Jesus said in verse 13. Because it is that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. So I think we need to answer the question then, what is Jesus' joy? The joy of Jesus was absolute self-surrender to the will of his Father and self-sacrifice. The joy of doing that which the Father sent him to do. Hebrews 12, 2 says, Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. And Psalm 40, verse 8 says, I delight to do your will, O my God, and your law is within my heart. Self-sacrifice, doing the will of God. These things were the joy of Jesus. So how have you allowed Jesus Christ to introduce you to his joy? Have you allowed him to do that? 
It's found by taking on the attitude of Christ. Even as Philippians 2.5 says, let this mind be in, in you which was also in Christ Jesus. In other words, have the same attitude that Jesus had. Which for us means, unconcerned with title, being as a slave in humility, sacrifice, obeying God even to the utmost, never complaining, but showing the results of salvation in both word and deed. All those things are from Philippians 2. And you know Paul wrapped it up with this in verses 17 and 18. He said, But I will rejoice even if I lose my life, pouring it out like a liquid offering to God, just like your faithful service is an offering to God. And I want all of you to share that joy. Yes, you should rejoice, and I will share your joy. There are things more important than the latest movie or the latest episode of whatever or the big game. The latest Christian living book that tells you you need to walk around in circles or chant God's names. Whatever might be keeping you from whatever might be keeping you from as Paul wrote in Philippians 2, living clean, innocent lives as children of God, shining like bright lights in a world full of crooked and perverse people. The word of God will never return void. And so these very things that Jesus is praying are being worked out in you and me as we study this morning. And I think that is something that we should take great joy in. Verse 14. I have given them your word and the world and the world has hated them because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I do not pray that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. All these things are contrary to the world, and so the world hates those who receive God's word. Yet Jesus did not pray for us to be removed from the world, but to be witnesses to the world. And Jesus didn't pray for believers' escape. He prayed for their preservation. It's amazing to watch how the world reacts to the Bible, or even in an age where, where, where burning the Quran can get, you a court, can, can get you a court martial in the military. Burning a Quran or, or saying something against Muhammad can, can get you lambasted or verbally beaten up by the media, even as a private citizen. The Bible has been desecrated, burned, used in heretical art, art exhibits, outlawed, removed and banned from schools. There must be something very special about this book. There must be for the world to hate it so. And indeed, there is something extra special about this book, something revolutionary. It's God's love letter to us. It is a call to repentance and an offer of grace. It contains 66 books, 40 different authors, most of whom didn't know one another, written over the course of thousands of years, yet it is without contradiction. It dares to predict the future and has the gall to be right about it. Yet without contradiction, it holds up to historical scrutiny. It even proves itself in the light of archaeological and linguistic discovery. It dares to say mankind is sinful and in need of a Savior. And it dares to tell us that while we are sinful, God gave His Son to pay the penalty for our sins. This book is truly remarkable. It dares suggest that self-help doesn't work. But only God's help will change our lives. There's no greater book. And there's no book more problematic for those who desire to love themselves. For those who desire to place man on a pedestal above God. I'm not kidding when, when I say you guys are, are out of this world. 
Because Jesus tells us that we are not of this world, just as he is not of the world. And though we may pray for and desire the soon rapture of the church, God is glorified in our remaining here. We're weary of this world. The Holy Spirit within us is grieved by the world. And, and we as his bride, we may say, come quickly, Lord Jesus. Yet Jesus here prays for us to remain and be kept from the evil one. I don't think we realize just how faithful God is to keep us from the evil one. I think if God were to open our eyes, we would be amazed to see the Calvary and the defenses that he has set up around us. Being that we are not of the world, what's the greater miracle here? That we should be taken from the world or that we be kept in the world and protected from the evil one? I suspect it's the latter. One key to this is God's ability to sanctify us. Sanctify means to set apart. And we are set apart by the mind of God which is revealed to us through the word of God. The word of God has a sanctifying effect on believers. As we read it and study it, we're set apart by Scripture, we're examined, we're reproved, we're corrected, and we're equipped for every good work. As we grow in our knowledge of the Word of God, we are set apart, we are conformed, prepared, if you will, to serve God in obedience to His Word. So Jesus equates the sanctification of believers with the Word of God, which is the truth. Psalm 119.9 says, How can a young man cleanse his way? by taking heed according to your word. Wisdom says that having the word of God, it only stands to reason that if we are to live pleasing to God, then we should look to his word for instruction. Now notice with me that Jesus did not say that the Bible contains truth. He said the Bible is truth. Many Christians today have been convinced, and sometimes by their pastor, that the Bible is a book of great moral stories, or even just moral suggestions. To teach that is at best dishonest. It's deceptive. Because the Bible says of itself that it is the literal Word of God. It says of itself that it is God-breathed. So like Jesus, who gave no means by which we can straddle a fence between believing in Him or or staying in the world if we want to be saved, the Bible also leaves us with no means by which we can say it is a book of great moral truths, but it lies about being from God. If the Bible is not what it claims itself to be, then it's a book of lies. And anyone who then holds it up as a book of morals is a fool. And so either we live it or we leave it. God didn't give us a choice when it comes to His Word and living lives that please and glorify Him. Now, one more thing and and, and we'll move on. Jesus says in verse 19 that He sanctifies Himself. Remember that sanctification is setting apart. And so when Jesus says he sanctifies himself, he's saying that he purposefully set himself apart for the work of the Father. In the manner in which he was separated unto the Father for the work of the Father, so we also must be set apart for the work of the Father. Verse 20. I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they all all may be one, as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they may also be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. And the glory which you gave me I have given them, that they may be one, just as we are one. I in them, and you in me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. 
Father, I desire that they also whom you gave me may be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory which you have given me, for you love me before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, the world has not known you, but I have known you, and these have known that you sent me. And I have declared to them your name, and I will declare it, that the love with which you loved me may be in them, and I in them. This is really wonderful. Jesus didn't limit his prayer just for that moment, but he reaches out beyond to all believers that would follow. Over 1,900 years ago, Jesus prayed for you. And he continues to pray for you, making intercession before the Father on your behalf. Jesus is our Kohen Gadol. He's our high priest. The book of Hebrews says in, in chapter 7, verse 25, it says, Therefore he is able once and forever to save those who come to God through him. He lives forever to intercede with God on their behalf. In the account of God's judgment of wickedness through the great flood, God told Noah to cover the ark inside and out in pitch, using the word kofar, which means both to cover and to atone. And that pitch which, which sealed the boat and kept it floating safe above those waters of judgment, we have a picture of the work of the atoning blood of Jesus to save to the uttermost those who call on his name. The mercy seat of the Ark of the Testimony, or the Ark of the Covenant. This was also a kofar, which was placed above, and, and it hid those items that represented Israel's sin and her rebellion. The manna, the broken tablets of the commandments, Aaron's rod that budded. Once a year, it was the duty of the high priest to enter the Holy of Holies where the ark remained and with blood make atonement first for himself and then for Israel by sprinkling the blood on that, on that kofar, on the mercy seat of the ark. The sacrifices that we studied in Leviticus provided a kofar or a cover for the sins of Israel. But they could not do what the sacrifice Jesus made on the cross did. His sacrifice provided the payment of the full penalty for sins. Once for all who believe, Ephesians 1.7 says, In Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of His grace. The sacrifice that Jesus made on the cross was a substitutionary sacrifice, meaning Jesus died as a substitute for sinful humanity, taking your place and my place on the cross. The Bible tells us that this was an act of love. John 15, 13 says, Greater love has no one than this, than to lay down one's life for his friends. Love for others is expressed through selfless living and through sacrificial giving. And so we, we talked about the unity of believers before. Now, in closing, we talk about the unity of believers toward the salvation of others. This is believers united in demonstrating the character of Christ through our lives so that the world might see Christ in us the way that the Father was seen in Christ. John 5.31, Jesus said, If I bear witness of myself, my witness is not true. We are not to be witnesses of ourselves. When we lay aside the requirements of love for comfort or when we set aside grace, we preserve the posterity of flesh as witnesses of ourselves rather than, rather than witnesses of Christ. This does not mean watering down the gospel in order to appeal to more people or to make witnessing more comfortable. This does not mean living as close to temptation as we can or compromising morality so that we appear more relevant to the majority of people. This does not mean, or this does mean carrying the cross, carrying the gospel into the world, knowing that it will offend many, probably bring suffering to ourselves, yet bless others who will receive Jesus.
who will choose love, grace, and mercy from our loving Lord. There's more that I want to say this morning from this section. We're, we're out of time, though. Next week, we'll pick it up here. Because there's so much in these last few verses of Jesus' prayer. I don't want to miss it. Next week, we'll move into chapter 18 as well, with Jesus' betrayal and arrest. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you, Father, for speaking to us this morning, for teaching us, for reproving us, uh, for your correction, for your instruction in righteousness. Lord, we do ask that you would continue that work in, in making us uh, complete and thoroughly equipped for every good work. Lord, we ask that you would fill us fresh to overflowing. Fill us with your Holy Spirit, Lord. Overflow these things in, out of us and into the lives of our friends, of our family, our co-workers. Lord, we ask that you would open up occasions where we have the opportunity to, to speak your grace into the lives of others. Lord, at the same time, we ask that you would keep us from compromise. Lord, if there are those who are watching the video or, or listening to the podcast, we ask, Father, that you would do a work in their hearts. That they would be convicted of their sins. And that they would call out to Jesus for salvation. Lord, we give you this day. We give you our lives. We place ourselves before you. And we say, Dear Lord Jesus, here I am, use me. Lord, we love you. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face and his light to shine upon you. May he lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace, his shalom. In the precious name of Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus, our Lord and our Savior, everyone said, Amen. Hi, I'm Pastor Sean, and I want to thank you for spending this time with us learning from the Bible about God's amazing love for you and I. I hope you've been blessed by this and also challenged by today's teaching. I want to ask a favor of you. This broadcast is reaching so many with the gospel, but we cannot do it without your help. Broadcasting costs money, and it could be that God wants to use you to help us continue this ministry. We don't have anything to send to you in return other than our sincere and heartfelt thanks for partnering with us to take the gospel to the world. If you can give 10, 15, 50, maybe $100 or more, it sure would help us to continue this work of faith. You can make your donation online at calvarybirmingham.com backslash partner, or you can mail it to Calvary Chapel Birmingham, care of Grace Love Hope, 225 Oxmoor Circle, Suite 801, Homewood, Alabama, 35209. Thank you so much for partnering with us, and may the Lord bless you.